46 years ago, the modern LGBT movement was born in a riot in the West Village of New York City. Today on The Laura Flanders Show, from the archives, an interview with author and law professor Dean Spade on poverty, prisons, and the new transgender civil rights movement. All that and an exclusive preview of Spade's new film about pinkwashing, and I discuss the loss of social justice fighter and co-op maker Ricky Macklin. Welcome to our program. Dean Spade is a professor of law at the University of Seattle and a visiting professor at Columbia Law School. He's also the author of Normal Life, Administrative Violence, Critical Trans Politics, and the Limits of Law. He's got quite a different approach to how we need to change ourselves in this society. And he's also the founder of a poverty law project called the Sylvia Rivera Law Project that's been doing just that right here in New York and around the country. Dean, welcome to the program. Glad to have you. Thank you. Let's start with Silvi Sylvia Rivera. The Sylvia Rivera Law Project, which you founded, what, 10 years ago, um, was named after a very special person, but not someone who's well known. Can you tell us a little bit about Sylvia? Yeah. Sylvia Rivera um, was a trans woman of color activist who um, was extremely active in the 60s and 70s. She is one of the people who was at the Stonewall Rebellion. Um, some people credit her as being the first one to you know, throw something at the cops. Um, so she's kind of a historical figure of great import for that reason. But I think for um, the Sylvia Rivera Law Project, the reason she's so important to us is because she's someone who throughout the course of the kind of mainstreaming of the gay and lesbian rights movement in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, and today, um, she was a voice saying, we cannot keep marginalizing people of color, poor people, um, from the conversation. And she really stood up against the ways that trans people were kind of kicked out of the movement, um, and the ways that the um, gay and lesbian rights frame came to really center um, white people, people with wealth, people who met sort of traditional norms around gay and lesbian identities that look as much as possible like straight couple identities. And she died in 2002, um, the year that I started the project, and uh, we really do our work sort of with her as one of our key inspirations about what it means to build racial and economic justice in our struggle for trans resistance. And what is a poverty law center? What does that mean? Um, so it means that one of the main things we do is we provide free legal help to poor people who are facing a bunch of different issues. In the context of our work, um, trans and gender nonconforming people experience really specifically difficult conditions inside the systems that poor people are concentrated in. So as you can imagine, homeless shelters, juvenile um, facilities like foster care group homes, jails and prisons, all these places are gender segregated, in men's, women's, girls and boys, and they're places of extreme violence for gender outsiders. And also for a lot of trans people, there's a lot of exclusion. Like w our clients can't get placed in drug treatment, can't get into a shelter because they're going to be placed incorrectly and they're going to face a lot of violence. So. We're looking at the specific, really intense conditions of violence and, um, and poverty that trans communities are facing, and we're providing free legal assistance from things like deportation proceedings to welfare hearings. How has the economic crisis of the last few years affected the people that you work with? The economic crisis has had huge impacts um, on our clients. Already, the people we work with are criminalized and highly um, poor and homeless. But uh, cuts to existing programs and benefit systems, really going back to the 90s even, have made a major impact um, on people's ability to get the basic needs met, to get housing. And of course, the drastic growth in criminalization and immigration enforcement mean that more and more of our clients are locked up in various prisons. So how does it work? I mean, talk about how, a, 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 I was going to say, your average trans person um, is affected. What's the trajectory from maybe having a low-wage job to finding themselves criminalized or locked up? Mm -hmm. Well, most trans people can't even get low-wage jobs because there's just really widespread discrimination. People are just like, we don't want to hire someone like that to work in our store or whatever it is. So most people are pushed into criminalized economies. A lot of trans people are in the sex work economy because it's one of the only places where 
trans people are allowed to work. Um, so that, of course, leads to high levels of criminalization, but also because there's a stereotype, specifically that trans women of color are all sex workers, tens of our clients are people who, whether or not they were engaged in anything illegal, are getting profiled and policed. Um, and so there's several sort of roots to criminalization that way. But also, you know, it's a crime to be a poor person in the United States. And in New York City, you can see this every day. Sleeping outside is a crime that can get you locked up. Um, sitting on the sidewalk if the cops think you're poor or homeless can be a crime, right? So just getting by and being poor means going to jail. Are trans people more likely to be homeless? Trans people are more likely to end up homeless. Um, one of the main reasons is that it's so unsafe in the existing shelter systems. So one of the pieces of work of the Sylvia Rivera Law Project over the last 10 years has been focused on the treatment of trans women in the Department of Homeless Services here in New York City. And this work has ricocheted around the country where we've worked with a lot of groups um, concerned with similar issues. In general, in homeless shelters, trans women are denied access to women's shelters. So the option is go into the men's shelter and be the only woman there and face enormous likelihood of sexual assault or stay street home because you're just trying to figure out what's the safest thing. And if you don't go into the shelter system in most cities, you can't qualify for other forms of low-income housing. So there's both the problems around um, job discrimination that produce likelihood of homelessness and poverty, and then there's the fact that the minimal services we have don't accommodate trans people. And what about family care? We hear a lot about people staying much longer than normal with their, with their families, their birth families, or going home when they can't find a job. Unfortunately, most trans people experience a lot of family alienation because of our identities. So um, there's always the counter stories and there's a lot of hope in that area and I think there's some changes happening, but it's a pretty typical experience not having family support if you're trans, which can contribute to um, the poverty you're experiencing having a deeper impact because there's not a safety net there. So, okay, we've established you're dealing with people who are some of the most vulnerable, most vilified, most criminalized in our society. You come out with an analysis that isn't just about them or isn't even about them, it's about our society. What have you learned, um, broad strokes, from this work that maybe has surprised you or led you in directions you, you never imagined you'd go? I think that the biggest um, takeaway from the work I've done at the Sylvia Rivera Law Project for the last 10 years is the significance of different forms of criminalization in the lives of poor people. Um, and the ways that that criminalization is highly racialized and highly gendered. So both in terms of who gets arrested and what the police think looks unusual and who, which neighborhoods they spend time patrolling and all of those pieces, who is it who's doing work or surviving in ways that are gonna give them too much contact with the police and cause that sort of route? And also in terms of what actually happens in America's prisons, right? We're the most imprisoning nation in the world. We have 5% of the world's population and 25% of the world's prisoners. And the people in our prisons are primarily people of color and poor people in prisons for crimes related to poverty. And inside those prisons, there is outrageous racial and gender violence in all of them right, in the women's men prisons and in the men's prisons. And so all of that picture, right, plus the additional picture of how much our immigration system has grown, and especially the last 10 years, how we're deporting more people than we've ever deported in the U.S., and how our immigration prisons have also grown by about fourfold and also are privatized and are run out of profit. All of that, when you look at that picture, that is one of the biggest sources of violence in the lives of Americans, in my opinion. And what does it have to do with our model of change? Because often our m m stories of change in, in this country have been, well, if you can just criminalize certain kinds of behavior, even things like discrimination or violence against women, um, hate crimes, that will somehow improve society. Um, what, will it? Are you happy about hate crimes and, and the legislation that has tried to criminalize discrimination? Yeah, well, one of the really interesting um, contests inside trans communities and more broadly in queer and trans politics is whether or not hate crimes laws actually work, whether or not they're a good way to try to deal with the fact that there is a huge amount of violence against queer and trans people. And a, a lot of us are saying, actually, this strategy doesn't really work, right? What it does, it definitely doesn't prevent violence against us. Nobody has ever argued that when people are thinking about who to beat up or kill tonight, they look through some book and they say, oh, there's a higher penalty. If I do it for that, I won't do it, right? That's not how violence works. So there's no argument that it prevents our deaths or our beatings. But what it does do is it enhances the punishing power of the system that is actually the main perpetrator of violence against us. In the lives of SRLP clients, the most common perpetrator of violence is the police or corrections officers or immigration officers, that system, right? So what does it mean to add power to that system? 
providing no relief to us. And, the, and part of the way we see it is that basically that system has been desiring growth very intensely for at least the last 40 years. And that growth has been motivated by profit because prisons are profit, privatized, et cetera. And so the real reason this system wants to pass hate crimes laws and put our names on it is not because it's gonna save our lives, but just because the system wants to grow in any direction. And so we've really been looking carefully at whether or not that strategy has any benefit for preventing violence. So when you look over the 10 years of the Sylvia Rivera Law Project, and congratulations on your 10 years, um, what do you see? I mean, there's certainly more visibility, there's more inclusion, there's more quote unquote tolerance. Um, what else? I guess I would say that it, well, it's interesting. In the last 10 years, you've seen more like gay and lesbian organizations put T in their mission statements. There's some more visibility in the media of certain kinds of stories about trans people. Yet the actual conditions on the ground for trans people are worsening with growing criminalization, immigration enforcement, and the growing wealth divide in the United States, which of course the Occupy movement has made very visible. visible. So I think that's one of the questions that I'm essentially asking in the book. How come sometimes certain kinds of visible inclusion practices don't result in material gains. And I think you can ask that more broadly, looking at the last 40 or 50 years in the United States and saying, wow, there's been so much work to declare us all equal in law, to say that racism and ableism and sexism are illegal. And yet you've seen the actual conditions of racialized violence and of the growing apparatuses of criminalization worsen. You've seen the wealth gap worsen. You've seen women still having an enormous pay, uh, wage gap, right? You've seen the attacks on reproductive health worsen. So, you got to ask, you know, what is it about legal inclusion or legal equality frameworks that don't deliver the goods on the ground? So what is it? Well, <laughs> I, I, I mean, I guess part of what I think I'm learning from my own experience in, um, in trans resistance and other movements is that um, those promises of legal equality that allow state apparatuses of violence to grow in our names don't actually deliver what we need. And to actually get what we need, it's really grassroots struggle that's been what's ever won anything meaningful in terms of material change in the US. And so I think that question of how can we turn our attention away from just trying to get our names on hate crimes laws or our names on anti-discrimination laws that aren't gonna deliver the goods towards um, actually building meaningful strategies for dismantling criminal um, and imprisonment regimes, for you know uh, getting rid of these like violent border regimes that we have and for actually re addressing poverty. There's two things I want to just quickly lift up from your book, which is some of the ways you use language. One of them is that you don't talk about discrimination, you talk about life shortening. Mm -hmm. I'd like to ask you about that choice. And then the other, you talk about a pr a, a, an imprisoning society and you talk about people being criminalized, whereas in most legal texts you read about people conducting or perform, you know, engaging in criminal behavior or um, criminality existing in certain communities. Talk about some of those choices and, and, and what you're thinking, what's the thinking behind them? Yeah. Life shortening. Life shortening. So the reason that I talk about, um, you know, harm and violence facing communities in terms of life shortening or sometimes I talk about the distribution of life chances is because I'm trying to get us to think in a material way on the ground about why some people's lives are affected by lack of health care, lack of adequate nutrition, being exposed to more pollutants because they live in a neighborhood that's been targeted for that kind of industry. Those kinds of sort of really material, harmful conditions that face us and that I think our communities are trying to resist and resolve. I'm trying to talk about that because I want us to move away from a conversation that's solely about whether we can get the law to say good things about us, whether we can say, you know, the government has declared that it's not okay to beat up trans people, right? That we have the federal, um, Matthew Shepard, James Byrd hate crimes law, and people see it as a big stance against violence. Of course, it won't prevent the violence that we're talking about, and all the actual material conditions shortening our lives are happening all the time, right, and are being um, exploited and increased by austerity measures and other moves from that same government that now declares that our deaths are a problem, right? So I think that part of what the book is trying to do is shift us away from asking what does the law say about us to what are legal structures doing to us and how do we actually resolve material conditions. Hence the active verbs around criminalizing and imprisoning. Yeah, and I think that the other thing about um, criminalization is that our current prison system um, and our sort of you know, we live in a country where 24 hours a day you can watch Law and Order on TV, right? There's a lot of propaganda around criminality that tells us that there's these dangerous, bad people, serial killers, serial rapists, they've got these criminal behaviors. In reality, our criminal justice system works very differently than that, right? What The reality is that all of us break laws all the time, but only certain people in certain communities are heavily policed and pushed into prisons, usually for very low-level crimes related to poverty. So when we move away from thinking about individual criminals and bad people, which is kind of the fiction that justifies the system, and instead looking at 
these giant nets that are cast over, primarily people of color and poor people communities, to bring in more and more people into these private prison systems where, you know, prison guards unions and um, prison corporations, you know, are seeking to influence politicians to pass more criminalizing laws that will fill the beds and make more money. So it's a very different way of thinking about what criminality is and what crime is and what we would actually do to try to have a safer country. Does it change our perspective on change making um, and how social justice increases in society? We often are led to believe, well, if you let some people go forward, then the rest of us will follow. Um, but you suggest it's the other way around. Yeah, so one of the ideas that um, I you know, notice is really centered in a lot of the activism that I care about and I'm writing about is an idea that I call trickle up social justice as opposed to trickle down. So one of the ways of thinking about social change is let's get the few most charismatic people, the people who look the most like what society already thinks are good people and have a few really spectacular cases and maybe some, you know, New York Times articles about them and people will think we're good and like us and perhaps we, you know, will make an advance for everyone. It turns out that doesn't really work, right? It turns out that if you solve the problem for people who are the least vulnerable vulnerable of the vulnerable, usually you end up mobilizing ideas that actually further the stigma of those who are considered outside or not good enough, right? And so the idea of trickle-up social justice is that we should actually ethically start with those who are facing the worst conditions, who are most losing their lives, right? Those people in prisons and immigration facilities and um, experiencing poverty and homelessness, we should start by figuring out how to solve the problems for them. And inevitably that will solve the problems for everyone, right? But it's not the reverse. And so that's part of, I think, the idea that's really a critique of the gay and lesbian rights framework that has really taken up the kind of, you know, strategy of choosing a few charismatic white couples and having that be the image of what an anti-homophobic framework is. And that hasn't really worked out for people on the bottom. Pinkwashing. What is it? The act of using support for LGBT issues to cover up other human rights abuses. Dean Spade just released a new and powerful film on this subject. Here's an exclusive excerpt. Israel's attack on Gaza is a one-sided war of destruction fueled by Israel's machine of war and occupation. It is so important to the state of Israel that people in the U.S. only hear one story. A campaign to um, promote the image that Israel is a safe haven for gay and lesbian people and a great anti-homophobic place. Israel is not a gay-friendly country. Israel is gay-friendly when it serves its purposes. Propaganda for Israel to cover over its brutal brutal apartheid regime. This just one of 160 airstrikes by the Israeli military on Gaza overnight and into this morning. The hospitals here filling up rapidly with casualties, most of them civilians, according to Palestinian health officials. I feel like it, in my mind, is like a distraction technique to be like, look over here, look over here, don't look over here, and all the other things that we're doing that are really horrible, and all the people we're killing, but look over here and think about rich gay people and how they want to come visit us and how great we are. With a gay scene that competes with all gay capitals around the globe, an amazing beach, good weather, great food, and other attractions in the country like Jerusalem and the Dead Sea, Tel Aviv is definitely a place you should go and check out for your next trip. There is no magic pink door in the apartheid wall. We may be queer. I can show up at, an, at, at Ben Gurion airport and say I'm lesbian, let me in. They're not gonna do that because I'm Palestinian. So when you say gay friendly, which gay person are you talking about? There was gonna be like an orchestrated tour, totally funded by the Israeli consulate, and the city of Seattle was gonna be hosting an event where a delegation would be able to speak about gay rights in Israel. Probably they have no idea that this is part of a propaganda campaign, that it's funded by the government of Israel, that it's you know part of this much larger project that really has very little to do with LGBT people or fighting homophobia or transphobia, and a lot more to do with defending colonialism and apartheid. You saw that recognition dawn around the table on the commissioners' faces of what did we get ourselves into? They voted to cancel an official event that was supposed to happen the next day. Like, business as usual got disrupted. The city council in Seattle was at an uproar. I don't think they had any idea what was coming.
Part of that rebranding, Israel is, is, is putting money and resources towards what, what activists that I'm involved with call a pinkwashing campaign, which is a campaign to um, promote the image that Israel is a safe haven for gay and lesbian people and a great anti-homophobic place. So it's done that by funding films that um, promote those ideas and sending them to film festivals. Um, in the United States, it funds panels of um, gay and lesbian rights activists and leaders to go around the United States and give talks about how forward-thinking Israel is, how innovative Israel is on gay and lesbian rights issues. There's certain things I've noticed that help me spot the propaganda, right? So one obvious thing is that it might be funded directly by the government through the consulate or another source. Are there particular images used that kind of promote an idea that Israel is a safe haven or a mecca? One example I often see is a rainbow flagged Israeli flag, or these two flags kind of coming together and overlapping, that there might not be words listed, but I know what the image is trying to tell me. Pinkwashing also, it has a number of tropes, but sort of, they're very recycled. Once you start to see the films and speakers across the board, they're kind of saying the same thing every time. So that's also one way we can discern what is it about. So things that they will say are, Israel is the only safe place for gay people in the Middle East, right? There's often the terrible use of the term Mecca to say it's a gay Mecca. There's a, often a glamorous painting of the Tel Aviv nightlife as a sort of like gay tourism destination that would be a wonderful place to visit, just be careful of the scary homophobic Arabs outside of Israel's borders. The point of this is not to protect LGBT people, right? Like, in reality, there's immense homophobia in Israel and the United States. I mean, I, I don't know of a country that doesn't have serious problems with homophobia and transphobia. But the point of this is propaganda for Israel to cover over its brutal, brutal apartheid regime. That was an excerpt from the film Pink Washing Exposed, Seattle Fights Back, directed by our guest, Dean Spade. You can get more information about the film and Spade at our website. Melvin Ricky Maurice Macklin died earlier this year. Born to sharecropper farmers in Tennessee, Macklin went on to become a vice president of United Electrical Workers 1110, a leader of the historic six-day factory occupation of Republic Windows and Doors in December 2008, and a co-owner of the New Era Windows Cooperative in Chicago. He died May 5th at 61 years old after being diagnosed with stage four pancreatic cancer in early April. I first met Macklin when he appeared on Grit TV to talk about the occupation of the factory. In a time of mass layoffs, he and his co-workers had decided not to go meekly home when they were let go. Instead, they occupied their workplace and demanded accountability from their boss and from the Bank of America, which had cut off the factory's credit right after receiving $25 billion in federal bailout monies. The occupation led to the plant reopening under a new owner called Sirius Energy and the payment of all back pay, a victory. But when that owner, too, decided suddenly to close in 2012, Macklin and his colleagues had a decision to make. They led a second worker occupation, but then they pursued a new idea, a trickle-up instead of a trickle-down economy. Republic walked away from our jobs, he said. Sirius walked away from our jobs. But we're not walking away from our jobs. At the time, the workers decided to buy the equipment they worked on and become co-owners of the company themselves. It should have been easier. It should have been easier to start a minority-run business selling green products in a high unemployment community at a time when politicians and bankers were all talking up a storm about stimulating the economy. It wasn't easy. It was hard. Only with training and capital from the nonprofit lenders at the Working World Organization and months of unpaid labor by the workers and their families were they finally able to do it. On the eve of the opening of the New Era Windows Cooperative, Macklin admitted it was all very risky. But no riskier to men like Macklin than business as usual. Along the way, we've learned that we are so much more than we thought we were, he told us. What will we all do in his honor? Make a new healthcare system? Make a new economy? He could have done with both. In his last interview, Ricky told us that being a co-owner was the best feeling in the world. How about helping someone realize their dream of change today in Macklin's honor? Thanks for watching. You can write to me, Laura, at grittv.org. And thanks.